I was hesitant to bring you onto this team. <laughs> but right now, the world needs a son of a bitch. And you're the only one I got. You know, you don't have to call me Peacemaker. You can call me Chris. Just because you're handsome doesn't mean you're not a piece of Think I'm handsome? Unlike most streaming shows, this is one show where nobody's going to skip the opening credits because we all want to watch that dance number. How long did it take each of y'all to choreograph that dance, starting with, with you, John? Uh, it took me a hell of a lot of time, and I can tell that I'm a slow learner because I know Jen also practiced very hard, and she was masterful. Um, I'm, I'm just a, a slow adapter to, to rhythm and grace, but uh, I'm so glad that James crafted something to defeat the skip intro button. How about you, Jennifer? How do you handle the opening dance number? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it was awesome on this series. I got an opportunity to, uh, in my off days, go practice dancing and practice fight choreography and practice, you know, uh, tactical weapons training and all these other things um, that, that were just so much fun for me. And this was one of those things. And we had a choreographer named Carissa Barton who did a fantastic job of choreographing and then also spent a ton of time with us in our off time uh, teaching us and you know perfecting us and telling us you know that we needed to be more rigid and more and less uh, emotion and you know so um, it was it was so much fun I spent a lot of time in the mirror in my gym just uh, you know doing the doing the motions and learning it it was it was so much fun though I had a great time I can see that dance going crazy on TikTok. Is that the goal, John? Do you want to see a bunch of fans reenacting it on social media? I think the goal is just to get people to see the people who worked on the show, I think, to, to not skip the intro. Uh, now, do we have a, a wonderful uh, mixture of possibly great timing so people can, can try their hand at a Peacemaker introduction dance? Sure. Uh, is that going to work out? But that's yet to be told. I just I, I want people to watch the dance number all the time so they can see who's in the show. I, my big my big idea was that we do a flash mob. Unfortunately, that's not something we can really do <laughs> during COVID times. It's more difficult. But I was like, oh, if the cast got together to promote the show and did a flash mob, it would be great. Jennifer, I want to get your take on this first. Peacemaker has a bunch of different helmets. So if you were to have a helmet in your real everyday life, what ability would you want that helmet to give you? Oh, I think invisibility would be really cool. A lot of people pick invisibility. How about you, John? Uh, professionally speaking, and being invisible is not as cool as you might think. Um, I, I you would, know a uh, lot about that, don't you? The ability to read minds and for no other reason uh, than to, to be able to process empathy a lot better. To see, uh, we, we, we have a lot of trouble nowadays uh, finding a bridge between one opinion and another. And I think if people just... Uh, took an effort to see why people think the way they do. Maybe it'll could be a bridge to bring us closer together. I think that'd be a lot more useful than the scabies helmet. Uh <laughs> you gotta challenge yourself every once in a while, man. Game day, Aren't you guys being a little nonchalant about all this? Are you insinuating there is a wrong time and a right time to rock? James, it's a pleasure to talk about Peacemaker because he was such a standout character in the Suicide Squad. Now it's a streaming show. So how creatively freeing was it to get all this time with Peacemaker? It was a blast. I mean, it was with Peacemaker, but with the entire ensemble cast, Daniel Brooks is at a bio and Steve Agee and Jen Howland and really getting to know this group of people. I, I was just thinking about how, you know, I have made the Guardians of the Galaxy movies, right? And we're going to have three full movies that are only as long as this one series of, 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 of characters. So we get to know John Economos as much as we get to know Star-Lord or more at this point. So that has been a real freeing thing and the ability to go into creating a television show where I can take my time with the relationships, let the drama go further, let the comedy go further, let the action scenes go for longer, let everything take its time a little bit more was absolutely um, miraculous for me. I loved it. Well, you mentioned that phenomenal cast. I think you set a record here. I think you're going to have the most unskippable intro in the history of streaming. What can you tell me about that dance sequence number? It's so fun to watch. Was it as fun 
for you to direct? It was. I mean, I first of all, I want to vanquish the skip forward button. There's a lot of people that work hard on the show, and I want people to get to see the name of our production designer, Lisa, our editors, Fred and Greg, and all of our guest stars and actors, and I want them to see those names. And so um, I thought I wanted to create something that people would not want to skip over and watch eight episodes of. And uh, and uh, I got together with a choreographer by the name of Carissa Barton, who did a fantastic job helping me put together um, what was in the script, which was the wigwam song, Do You Want to Taste It? And then the basic concept about everybody uh, dancing incredibly seriously while the dance moves are as ludicrous as possible. And, uh, and I showed Carissa a few little dance moves of myself and said something kind of like this. And she was like, I got it. And then she put the whole thing together and it was the least amount of work I had to do. We shot it all in one day in a high school auditorium. And, um, and it was a blast. The actors worked really hard, you know, rehearsing the scenes. Some of them are, are better uh, dancers than others. Some of them aren't the greatest, <laughs> Robert Patrick. Um, but, uh, but they all were very exuberant about it. So that made it worthwhile. Well, I heard from Chuck that that was actually the day they all shot that is when he got the news that he was going to be cast in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Is there oh. anything you can tell me about, about his character or, or oh, about wow. what you're thinking about? I, I forgot about that. That's great. In, bit of tid, tid, bit of information. No, I can't tell you anything. I can tell you one thing. I can tell you he's been fantastic and everyone has been blown away by how good he is in Guardians 3. He is absolutely one of the best actors I've ever worked with, you know? And um, he's just he's just marvelous in the movie. Dude, we're saving the world. It's everything we've ever wanted. Dude! Chakuti, I want to start with you because you're Mern, you're the leader of this <laughs> ragtag group. What's it like being the leader of a group like this? How do you keep everyone in check? Um, <laughs> I keep everyone in check because the script says that I do. Because in reality, <laughs> mate, I was as bad as the rest of them laughing and just breaking up and all that stuff. But um, it, it is it is that thing. It was hard to play. It really was hard to play the straight man in that group. You want to be part of the fun and, and improvise and, and, and have fun with them. But that actually was the most vicious. That's the brilliance of how it was written was that he, he does you know, have to keep check on them, regardless of how difficult it was for me as an actor to keep a straight face. That challenge by Mern was actually a, a lot of fun to play. So I, I just usually would, you know, if I if I couldn't keep a straight face looking directly at John, I'd find a way not to look at him as I did the line, you know, in general, little tricks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Freddie, you get to play vigilante and it's such a different version of vigilante that you really made it your own. What were the, the sort of the cues that director James Gunn gave you in playing that character? Which way was he steering you? Uh, well, I mean, he, it was it was on the page, really. Like as soon as I started reading it, I was like, this is this is not uh, this is not vigilante from the comics. This is uh, this is James Gunn's uh, Adrian Chase. Um, and he was he would steer me in every single way you could imagine it would be like okay so he he thinks he wants to be really violent or he thinks this is really funny or he thinks you know he's he's just he really wants peacemakers love it was just it was every which way so that you kind of really can't figure him out and it's hard it was kind of always hard to figure him out on the page but that's what's the fun part that coming up with your own uh, in a monologue is a, is a lot of fun especially when it's you get complete creativity with that and Matthew is the executive producer. You have this character with Peacemaker that now you took from a movie and you're trying to make a whole streaming series around. What are some of the biggest challenges in doing that? Well, I, you know, honestly, I, I think it's not as much a challenge as it is an opportunity. When you have a character like this that's a deeply flawed kind of anti-hero, it, it really serves it well to be able to explain and dig into that backstory over a period of like eight episodes, as opposed to like in the background or a part of an ensemble of one movie, you know, and you have a character and you may sort of write them off as being maybe they're not, not the most likable character, but through the course of this series, you're able to sort of peel back the layers and understand why this guy became this way. And then ultimately see, you know, is there a chance for redemption there? Well, if you talk about challenge beating opportunity, we got to talk about what I consider to be the most unskippable intro in the history of streaming 
content. Now, Matthew, did you feel like that guy at the wedding that, that can't get on the dance floor? Were you more envious or were you more relieved that you actually <laughs> didn't have to be in the number being behind the camera? Yeah, I mean, for, for, <laughs> for us behind the camera, it was a joy to watch these guys perform. Um, you know, I don't know that you would feel that this was one of the greatest openings in the history of streaming if I was in front of the camera. I think that <laughs> you, you may revise your take on it for a second. But, you know, it was it, I, what I will say was to be on the set and to watch them do it, you know, as many times as they did over and over. And each time, like usually on take 20 of something, you're you're sort of a little spent, you know, but watching this thing over and over and, and really, it was the, probably the most pleasurable day of shooting that we had on, on the entire shoot. It was It was truly a joy and all of them just came out and nailed it. Okay, so Chuck, I'm hearing at least 20 takes. How many takes before you got it right? I didn't. What makes you think I ever got it right? That's when my editing comes in handy, mate. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Freddie? Was that just a joy to shoot, uh, or was it a little bit of stress, just making sure that you had the choreography down? Uh, well, it's you know, I you it's it was a it's a shock reading it. Just you just kind of see it on the script, you're like uh, opening credits characters dance uh, with straight faces towards the camera, and you just kind of it's 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 terrifying when you read that and then uh, it was uh you know a joy to see that um <laughs> once again james gunn knew exactly what he was doing so <laughs> well your co-star jen uh said that she thinks a flash mob would be a great idea can we count both of y'all in on maybe doing a flash mob at some point in the future to promote the show yeah um, i'd do okay. that yeah i'm down do that. as long as matt does it also yeah matt has to do it he's not allowed I'll to he's also. not allowed to hide behind the camera <laughs> I'm going to have to have a mask then. We're going to have to find the superhero mask. Yeah, Matt's got it easy. He doesn't have to dance. He doesn't have to wear the suit. I'm curious, Freddie, about the, the, the vigilante costume. Was it more like a, of a cool emotional thing for you to put it on for the first time? Or was the practical side of you like, oh, this may not be that comfortable to move around in? It was, it was, uh, I mean, it's, as soon as I put it on, I was like, this is so cool that like, I, 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 if I can't move, I don't care. It is just so cool. And it was very well, it was very well designed. These guys are, you know, these are the top, top end costume designers. They've done all the, they've done all the, the suits you've seen on, on, in the movies. And so it moved very well. Um, and it was, it was such a joy. You just, there was a, I was like, I'm, I am actually a, a superhero. This felt really, really cool. Chuck, I, I got to ask you, you're, you're working with James Gunn on this, and then you're also going to be in Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Is, is there anything you yeah. can tell us about your character in that, or at least what was it like to get that call? Well, you know, we've been talking about the opening dance sequence. When we were filming that opening dance sequence, we did a take. And James came up to me and said, do you want to come see the, 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 the take, you know, and stuff? And can I have a word with you in a second? And I, I joked, I said, is this where you tell me you were actually looking to hire Chiwetel Ejiofor, not Chikudi Wuji? Is this where <laughs> you say goodbye? And he says, no, no, that's not it at all. In fact, um, I don't know what your schedule is, but I'd like you to play in Guardians of the Galaxy 3 on that day that we filmed that. So... Uh, <laughs> I have very fond memories of that day because that's when he, he um, made the offer to me. So, yeah. And it's wonderful working with him. And I, I, all I can tell you about the character it couldn't be more different from Mern. And it is the culmination of a lot of my background, which is in classical theater and Shakespeare. It's, it surprises me every day how much the two worlds come together in uh, playing this role. So that's, that's all I'll tell you. But it is awesome. <laughs> You don't understand what we're up against. We need every hand on deck. Is that an eagle? It's eagle. The sidekick. Ah, my ass! <laughs> what the f with your bird? Such a good handsome boy. Robert, I'd like to start with you with a fun sure. question. <laughs> sure. Um, James Gunn has said that your character, Augie Smith, is one of the worst dads that he's ever written for. <laughs> so <laughs> what's it like to play a horrible father to Peacemaker? Uh, it's so much fun. Uh, it, it's such a well-written role. And, uh, uh, you know, as an actor to do something uh, so extreme and, and uh, just get to revel in all the ugliness that he's written is, is a joy. I don't know how to explain it. Uh, you, it's very liberating. 
then we have Peacemaker, who loves to bully your character, Steve. So right. what are those scenes like to shoot? Are, are you closer to cracking up on set or are you closer to crying on set? I mean, not even close to cracking up. We were cracking up. Uh, you know, John's incredibly funny. And, you know, there were there were some of those scenes where James is just like, yeah, just riff. Just, <laughs> you know, we, we've got the, the, the written line now, just riff. And uh, it, it was it was hilarious you know um james gunn's sense of humor really shines in this show and uh no i i have a thick skin it, i was okay with it. <laughs> uh peter i wanted to ask you what's it like being a producer on the suicide squad and now on peacemaker what about that convinced you that that these characters needed their own streaming show to really tell more of the story well you know i think that you know chris smith unlike some of the other characters in the Suicide Squad, did not really have much of an arc. He was an asshole at the beginning of Suicide Squad and he was still an asshole at the end. So he was one that we knew there was a lot more to talk about. When Bloodsport and Ratcatcher 2 are talking about their relationships with their father, you cut to him in the back and he's got kind of a wry grin on his face, but that's all we get from it. This series is really about that wry grin. What is the, what, what causes, what's going on in his mind in that scene? Is this, is this series? So, you know, we knew there was a lot to explore. Plus, John Cena is just one of the greats. Like, to be able to work with him over the course of eight episodes, um, he's so funny. He's got so much dramatic depth that people were completely unaware of that they really start to see in this, uh, in this series. Um, you know, it was just, a, it was a joy. We, we knew we needed more of John Cena and his tidy whities that the world needed that. So we, uh, we took it upon ourselves to give it to them. Yeah, well, I mean, I went to the gym all week and then I just felt completely emasculated watching the show last <laughs> night. Uh, hey, that's all Steven, him. <laughs> Steven Robert, I, I wanted to ask y'all about the opening credits. It's the most unskippable intro in streaming history. How long <laughs> did it take you to, to master those moves? Well, Steven can talk. Uh, we both uh, were a little overwhelmed with uh, trying to learn how to dance and uh, I think we both fixated on uh, Jen. Uh, <coughs> she was our, our leader to kind of get us through it. Uh, it. It was amazing. Very wonderful uh, gal that choreographed the whole thing. Uh, I was amazed at the amount of rehearsal we had and how much care and detail went into pulling this off. It, it was it was obvious it was very important to Mr. Gunn to get this just right. So uh, I had a hoot and thanks to Carissa uh, Barton for uh, choreographing it. And, I'm just thankful that Jen was in my eyesight so I could follow her lead. Well, Steve, Jen had told me that she thought a good idea for promoting the show might be doing a flash mob at some point with the dance. Oh. <laughs> would, can we get you into that? Yeah. I mean, I would do anything to uh, promote the show, but that sounds like a huge bummer to me. <laughs> it took me so long to uh, learn those very simple moves. You know, they, they broke us up into groups of threes and over the period of a few weeks, we would occasionally go in re and rehearse them. And my group was Jen and Chuck and uh, myself. And I, you know, I said earlier to somebody that each time we showed up for rehearsal, it was like Chuck and I were learning these for the very first time. And Jen, the very first time Carissa showed us the dance move, Jen could have shot it right then. She was so, so good. <laughs> You know, Mark, James actually wrote that sequence into the very first draft of the script. It was always in his mind yeah, that there yeah. was going to be this incredible dance number. Um, it was always there. Like he just he just knew that this was something he wanted. And, and, and hopefully we've created an unskippable intro that people will actually sit through it each time now. I don't know if there's a way to track it, but certainly I think you are <laughs> going to have that record for most unskipped. <laughs> intros we go back to you robert because your character the father makes all these different helmets and it's sort of like ben and jerry's where <laughs> i'm less concerned about the flavors that they made i want to know more about the flavors that didn't make the cut what are the helmets that didn't make the cut were there any helmets you wanted to make that we just didn't get to uh well, peter help me out what one was uh scabies well, or like scabies, scabies for all scabies. Like, the, yeah. uh, as Mark says, if Scabies for All made the cut, it is interesting to wonder what didn't make the cut. John kept uh, ad-libbing all this yeah. stuff, but I mean, he, I couldn't stay, I couldn't keep up with it. <laughs> he had all these ad-libs for all these helmets. I was like, what the hell? Where's he getting this info? <laughs> Steve, if you could have a 
Peacemaker helmet yourself, what power would you want it to give you in your real life? Um, <laughs> at, currently, I mean, seeing as how I've just spent two years stress eating my way through uh, COVID, I would say the power for weight loss. <laughs> immediate we, immediate weight loss is, w- would be my uh, my helmet of choice. <laughs> Uh, question for you, Robert, then Steve, I'd love to get your take on this as well. Uh, what is your experience working with James Gunn? Like what's the best thing about working with a director like James Gunn? Well, I got to tell you, it was a real learning and lesson for me working with him. Um, I had never worked with him before. And, um, uh, the, the first scene you see, uh, that I, that I shoot is the scene where, uh, my son comes over to my house for the first time and I'm cooking lunch and I haven't seen him in four years. And James looked at me and looked at John and said, okay, we're going to shoot the rehearsal. I love that. I've worked with directors that do that. Clint Eastwood, Billy Bob Thornton, guys like that, that like to shoot the rehearsal. So right away, I was in love uh, uh, with, with him. And uh, then as it progressed, the series progressed, he started throwing out ideas in takes. And uh, once I really kind of comprehend what was going on, it got more and more fun. Uh, Cause the ideas were fantastic and to implement them in the scene were uh, it was, it was really a, a great collaboration. And I think by the end of uh, uh, episode eight, I really kind of got the swing of things, you know, Oh, this is how it is to work with Mr. Gunn. So I had a ball. Yeah. James, James is a joy to work with. I mean, he's really funny on, on set and, um, like people talk like Cena's a great improviser. Like he's like one of the best people I've worked with as far as improv. And I, I, I come from a comedy background, but James is also a great improviser when we're on set. He's, I mean, this, the, the joy of working with James is he's also written the scripts that you're doing. So he knows exactly how it needs to be. If we get it in one take, we move on, but also he'll throw out lines that are so genius that he just thought of watching us say them like he'll be watching us and go oh my god and then he's on a mic the whole time and he's like say that so James is also like an amazing improviser 